It's 8 o'clock in Fairbanks and 6 p.m. in Barcelona, so we'll start the webinar right now. Welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the CI's Prediction Network Phase 2, also known as SIPIN2, and facilitated by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. My name is Betsy turner Bogren. Today's presentation is the second in the 2019 SIPIN2 webinar series, which is organized by Muyin Wang, who is a member of the SIPIN2 project team. Our webinar, entitled An Overview of European-Funded Project Applicate, will be presented by Pablo Ortega, who is with the Earth Science Department at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. A link to an online survey will be available at the end of today's webinar. Your feedback would be much appreciated, as well as suggestions for topics of future webinars. We have a couple housekeeping items before our presentation begins. There are two viewing options available today, gallery view and speaker view. You can switch between those views by clicking the icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen, which is indicated by the red arrow. At the bottom of your screen is the chat button, which is shown with the green arrow. You are invited to chat with other webinar participants at any time during the presentation. To do that, click the chat icon and select the name of the participant with whom you wish to chat. There is also an option to chat with everyone participating in the webinar. The chat panel is also where you can enter questions for the speaker. Please type your question into the chat window at any time, and I will, they will be, if questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, I will read them aloud. For troubleshooting or technical help, please contact Stacy Stout via email. Her address is Stacy, S-T-A-C-E-Y, at arcus.org. The SIPIN2 webinar, this SIPIN2 webinar event is organized by Muyin Wang. Mu Yin is a research scientist at NOAA and the Joint Institute for the Study of Atmosphere at the University of Washington. Mu Yin, at this point, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Betsy. Okay. It's our great pleasure to have a Dr. Pablo Ortega from Barcelona Supercomputer Center to give today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Ortega is a climate scientist and one of the two co-chairs of the Climate Prediction Group at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Pablo received degrees in physics from University of Salamanca in 2005 and a master in geophysics and meteorology and a PhD in physics in 2011 from Complutense University of Madrid. He has a broad range of interests, including paleoclimatology, ocean dynamics, decadal prediction, and climate feedbacks. One of the goals of CBIN, CS Prediction Network, is to build and strengthen the networking of scientists, stakeholders, and resource managers on issues related to CS prediction and predictability. So for this, we're glad to have Dr. Pablo Ortega today to talk about the EU-funded H2020 project, Abdicate, which is Advanced Prediction in Polar Regions and Beyond. Without further ado, now let's hear from Pablo. Thank you. Thank you, Mujin. It's uh, I can only thank you for this opportunity. Uh, should I? Yeah. Yes, please share your your screen. Take over the screen. Okay. Yep. So. Great. Perfect. Oh, and then go, go. There we go. Thank you. Just one second. I'm getting everything set. <laughs> So yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to, to represent Applicate and Applicate Partners here and, and to give you an overview of what the project is doing. I believe that there are many synergies and common interests with SIPIN and I hope that I convince you through the presentation that that's the case. And the idea that I had for, for the presentation was to basically to cover a little bit of Applicate to tell you what's the, which are the, the, the main uh, goals, the strengths of Applicate, and also the strategy that we are following. And then to move to, to the work package in which I'm involved, uh, that is more related to Arctic prediction. And within that context, uh, to give you a few ideas, a few examples of the, the ongoing work uh, that is done in, in the work package. 
So as Mujin explained uh, just before, uh, I'm coming. Uh, one second. Yeah, I'm coming from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, which is one of the uh, many partners that are, are involved in Applicate. Indeed, uh, we have a consortium of 16 different institutes from nine different countries, all uh, representing uh, large uh, parts of, Europe's, of, of Europe. And, and then we also have a third party that is Russia, uh, which has also a parallel uh, project also re related to the research in Applicate. Uh, all of us uh, have, a, have established a solid network of collaborations, not only within Europe, uh, but also overseas. Uh, this is something that uh, it's really key because many of the, of the work within Applicate is related to, to the Arctic. Just to give you an idea of the dimension of the project, uh, these are some numbers. So we are dealing with uh, 8 million euros uh, uh, for a project that covers four years and that started the 1st of November of 2016. Uh, so in about two months, we'll enter the, the last year of implementation. Uh, we've requested a six months uh, extension. And this is basically to make it up for some uh, semi six related delays. Uh, there were some simulations that needed to wait uh, because we didn't have the, the sim six uh, model versions. And we believe that we are going to be granted the, the, the extension and this is going to help us to basically have more scientific outputs and maybe and, and hopefully to have better outcomes at the end of the project. So the, the, the real mission of, of Applicate is to, to develop and hence uh, predictive capacity, not only for the weather, but also for the climate prediction in the Arctic and beyond. There is another important aspect that is that we care about the influence of the Arctic uh, climate change on the Northern Hemisphere mid-latitudes, and this for the benefit of policy makers, businesses, and society. You can see that this is a really ambitious Ob uh, objective uh, and uh, we, we, we believe that we can meet it basically because we have a solid uh, a structure and a solid consortium and this is solid basically because for example we're bringing together different communities like the numerical weather prediction and the climate prediction communities. This was in response to a survey that uh, is summarized here that was run uh, for 22 different marine stakeholders from the Arctic, and they, they all highlighted the importance of having predictions covering many different timescales, from tactical timescales from hours to weeks to operational months to years, and even strategic uh, years to decades. So we are meeting all of this uh, through the project, and, uh, and I will show some more slides later on about how we do this. But there are other good sides of Applicate that uh, provide really core strengths and, and it says we are involving experts from the Arctic but also from the mid-latitudes and that's because we care a lot about the linkages with, between the two of them. Then uh, an, another important point is that we are have engaged operational centers and this is good because we are hoping to produce enhanced predictions and if the operational centers are there, the impacts of these enhanced predictions will be more direct for the society. So, and also uh, we can learn a lot from, from, from all their knowledge that they have from the operations. And, and the other important uh, multidisciplinary side of Applicate is that we are combining modeling and observational work. And this is, for example, illustrated with uh, Mosaic, uh, which is producing uh, really novel observations that we are, we are feeding uh, into our models, basically to improve some parameterization. So we are combining the latest uh, observational products from the Arctic from, with the latest model developments, trying to, to benefit from them to, to, to improve the, the predictions. Then in, in a general approach, uh, we, we are trying to exploit as, many, as much as possible 
all potential collaborations, not only in Europe, but also at international level. So for example, uh, in Europe, uh, we, uh, we are part of the uh, Arctic cluster, and this is a cluster of projects funded by the European Union, all of them covering or focused on the Arctic, and uh, um, including some that are more uh, looking at the modeling side, some more looking at observations, infrastructure, coordination. Uh, there is a lot of um, coordination between all these projects, and this is a way of, to maximize the, the impact of, of applicable. Then also in terms of observations, uh, we are highly involved in many geopolar prediction activities and in, in the different phases actually. Uh, and I will show later, for example, how we are including some of this data. And another important uh, international initiative was that uh, many uh, applicant participants have been uh, playing a key role in defining a new MIP, uh, contributing to CIMIC-6, that is the Polar Amplification MIP, which is basically trying to identify which of the key changes uh, that will happen in the climate of, of the Earth uh, related to changes in, in the polar climate. Uh, I said before that uh, the main purpose of the project is to enhance the predictions, and this is the strategy that we are following. There is a first phase in which we are basically establishing the baseline of the, of the forecast systems that are participating to applicate. Then there is the second part in which uh, uh, the different um, uh, modeling centers are testing different enhancement, enhancements and trying to optimize also some use of observations and initial conditions. There is a test phase for these model enhancements and in particular uh, uh, about the in their impact on, on the prediction skill, uh, followed by a phase of recommendations that is used at the very end to produce new predictions, uh, which we hope that are going to be enhanced, speci specifically for, for the Arctic. We are right now uh, more or less around here. Um, uh, the, in the next uh, uh, yeah, 12, 14 months, we'll be working mostly on those. As for the project structure, I'm going to only talk about the scientific core. Uh, we have five uh, main work packages. The first is about evaluating the, the weather and climate models, so defining metrics, uh, metrics that cover, uh, for example, uh, the, the linkages with the mid-latitudes, which are not, uh, were not well established by, at the beginning of the project, but also yeah, about uh, skills performance and many different sites uh, to yeah to 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 the project then in work package two uh, they are dealing basically with improving the models and testing different developments uh, there is work package three in which they are doing pme experiments to 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 look at the linkages and establish the linkages between the arctic and, and the mid latitudes there is a work package four that is more about the observations and how to benefit the most from them. So they are doing things like testing new initialization methods or uh, data denial experiments to, to see which are the observations that contribute more better to, to the scale. And finally, uh, work package five, that is the one in which I'm involved and is about improving the predictive capacity. From the other ones, I, I'll just mention that we have work package seven, that is about user engagement and they are doing really nice work. Uh, they are in contact with stakeholders and they are trying to maximize the impact of applicate by establishing a, a two-way channel of communication with them. Uh, okay, so now I'll focus on work package five and I'll explain uh, briefly what we are doing and which are the main goals. Uh, so the first is to advance the understanding of the predictability mechanisms that are operating at three different timescales. And they, these were more or less commented before. So we have 
numerical weather predictions that are covering uh, the daily to weekly time scales. Then, and we have three uh, uh, meteorological centers in, involved. Then we have seasonal predictions uh, to cover from months to seasons, and we have three uh, modeling centers involved. And also the University of Louvain, uh, which is running statistical predictions. And then finally, we have climate projections to cover the very long time scales. Um, we have two centers involved. For, for the analysis, basically uh, what we are doing is uh, for numerical weather predictions, uh, including deterministic and ensemble forecast, also global and limited area models, and there is a strong focus on the GRL of polar, of polar prediction period, basically to benefit from, from the observations that are being produced and to have better validation. Seasonal predictions, we are covering the period 1993-2014. We have uh, initial, we're initializing forecasts in May and November, so only uh, we are targeting basically the summer and, 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 the autumn, and, and the winter, and we are running a minimum of 10 members. And in the climate projections, we are following the Harris-Smith protocol, which is a fixed forcing control experiment from con Forcing conditions from 1915 and transient run from 1950 to 2050. The second goal is to investigate uh, whether and how the linkages between the Arctic and the mid latitudes uh, have an impact on the prediction skills. So basically, what skill can we expect from, from, from initializing the Arctic sea ice, for example, and how it translates into skill over other latitudes? And finally, uh, the most important is to assess the added value of applicate developments in the prediction scale. And for this, uh, what we are doing is uh, repeating the experiments I was uh, mentioning before for the numerical weather prediction, seasonal prediction, and climate prediction at two different stages at the beginning of the project so that we can establish the baseline skill uh, of, of our systems. And then at the very end, uh, with new systems that include uh, many of the developments uh, that have been produced throughout the project, and in which we want to quantify which is the added value of applicate. And uh, some of the things that we're including, for example, is improvements in initialization that are tested in work package four and five, uh, improved components and models in, tested in work package two and five, and some of generation techniques that are new also in Work Package 5 and even new diagnostics that have been included in Work Package 1. Related to, to the main task, so the, the first one was to produce the, the stream one experiments, so the baseline experiments that was already done. We did an analysis of those experiments that is related to task 5.2, but also running other experiments in which we looked at things like sources of predictability, linkages with the mid-latitudes, and also the forecast of extreme events. We are now do, uh, analyzing the added value of uh, improved process representation on predictive skill with specific experiments in which, for example, we try enhance CS models, we increase the resolution just to see what's the impact on the scale, and also we improve the ensemble generation. And, and in, the, in, in the remaining of the project, what we'll be looking at is as the stream to experiments. So we'll be producing them and evaluating them. And from their analysis, we'll produce a set of recommendations for future forecasting of the Arctic. Now, uh, this concludes uh, the, the general introduction to the work package five, and then we'll describe some of the results that we, we've been producing. And this is, for example, a work that has been done by Lauriane Batte from CNRS in, in Metro France. And she's been looking at the, uh, at the skill predicting the total Arctic sea extent uh, in, in seasonal forecast that has been initialized in the 1st of May. And for the different uh, string one uh, forecast systems and also some Copernicus climate change systems. 
uh, all of them here represented. Uh, so this would be the room mean square error of the total Arctic sea extent uh, uh, evaluated against an SIDC. And what you can see is that the, the biases are not really big at the, at the beginning of the forecast, but they grow quite a lot and they become uh, quite important uh, towards September. Uh, she also includes some multimodal ensembles just to see how they compare with the individual members. And they do more or less well uh, in terms of, of, of this absolute error. There is a problem, however, when you're looking at the total Arctic sea extent, is that there might be some errors that are compensating. Uh, and that's basically because when, when you have a prediction, uh, there are areas in which uh, your model is going to underestimate the sea ice. Um, areas in which is going to overestimate it. So when you compute the CH extent, uh, these areas might, might compensate each other, and you might even have good, uh, uh, a small bias in, in the total CH extent, but representing really badly the location. So to, to, to see how sensitive the results are to this, uh, uh, what, what we use is a different index that was introduced by, by Gosling et al. in 2016, and it's an integrated SH error. Basically, what they do is to integrate all the errors regardless of the sign and to look at them. So when you integrate all these errors uh, and you compute it for the different systems, what you see is basically that the intermodal differences that we could see before, they are much less uh, strong. And something more interesting is that in this case, the multimodel seems to, to do better that, that than the individual models, which is suggesting that having a multimodel framework uh, can, can really help uh, to, to boost the skill over these areas. This would be in terms of the errors. Uh, Lorian has also looked at the, at the uh, um, correlation, so skill uh, with a different metric, the anomaly correlation coefficient. And she's compared it with the skill that you would get with April uh, persistent in the CS extent. So this is again uh, related to the CS extent. And you can see that all the models uh, beat persistence clearly. And all of them seem to show uh, some significant skill for up to three, four months. So all the way to August. This would be the threshold of significance at the 95th uh, confidence level. Uh, but we do see again that September uh, models uh, are actually struggling uh, to, to show some predictive skills. So maybe from May, we, we cannot expect to, 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 to have uh, in, uh, enough information to, to predict, at least in, in our systems, uh, with what will be the CS extent in, in, in the Arctic. That's something that uh, we hope uh, to improve in, in, in the stream two experiments. Uh, this is concluding the, illustrating, the illustration of this analysis by Lorian. Uh, then we have some uh, specific um, analysis with some individual models that are looking more at the benefits of initialization. So what I'm showing now are some plots of the work of Ilona Valisu, also from, from CNRS. And she's been looking at the CNRM model seasonal forecast and also at the uh, uh, counterpart historical experiments. So uh, initialized and non-initialized. And, and the seasonal forecast, they, they have been initialized in different months and run for different forecast, uh, forecast ranges. And what she's been doing is to look at different regions. I'm illustrating here two of them. So for the Greenland Sea, for example, what she's showing really nicely is that uh, all the forecast, um, or, uh, the historical experiments basically show uh, more sea ice and also thicker sea ice uh, for all, uh, all along the year and for all the lead times of the forecast systems, which means that forecast systems 
are initializing and that the, the information of initialization is persisting for more than four months in one case or even six months in, in, in the February initialized ones. So we can expect for some regions to have an added value of initialization that can last longer than six months. Uh, this would be for Greenland. Uh, the other region that I'm showing is the Czech GC. Um, for the Czech GC, the situation is radically different because you can see that uh, for uh, the historical are all uh, consistent, uh, all, are all within the spread of the initialized forecast, uh, regardless of the of the month of initialization and the forecast range. We suggest that for for this region, maybe we can not expect such a good uh, uh, added value of initialization. This is with the CNRM model. Uh, there is a slightly different analysis that uh, we have done here at the BSC with ECR3, that is the, the, the global, uh, the general circulation model that we that we're using. And this is a work by Ruben Cruz Garcia. What he's been looking at is the development of the forecast error in, in our system, our seasonal forecast system. And the results again I'm going to show are for May, uh, initialized forecast, again, in this time for a shorter period. And that's basically because of the way we were initializing. Here, the CIS is initialized with, with a reconstruction in which we, we force uh, our ocean and CS model with ERA entry, so with the one of the European reanalysis, uh, and, and then we assimilate some uh, CS concentrations from, from the uh, European Space Agency. Then we're taking RS4, that is the ocean uh, reanalysis from uh, the European Center, and ERA interim for initializing the atmosphere. And this strategy has a, a problem, and it's basically an inconsistency in the initial conditions of the sea ice and the ocean. Uh, there are regions in which the ocean is too warm, uh, and so we are imposing some sea ice on top uh, in initialization, and the ocean is going to melt it away quite rapidly. And this has impact uh, on, on the predictions. There are also regions in which the ocean is too cold, so we're going to be creating sea ice. Uh, what Ruben has been doing is to see how the different error manifests and, and which are the regions in which the inconsistency and its effect can uh, persist for, for longer. So this is what I'm showing here. Uh, so if you focus on, on, on this, on this uh, row, uh, we have the forecast errors uh, for the 10th day of, after initialization, the 20th and the 30th. Here you have uh, what is the initial consistent inconsistency in the sea ice, and this we determine basically by comparing the sea ice that RS4 uh, is forced with, with the sea ice that we are imposing from our reconstruction. So you can see that, the, for example, to the west of Greenland, uh, we are melting a lot of sea ice. Uh, I mean, we have much less sea ice than uh, RS4 would, uh, uh, would agree with. And then uh, at the bottom, what we have is the systematic errors as determined by some historical simulations. So what Ruben has been doing is to, to compare how these forecasts uh, look, uh, or uh, how much they agree with the initial inconsistency on, 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 on the systematic error as a function of the forecast time. So at the beginning, you can see that they look quite alike, uh, the initial forecast error and the inconsistency, and that the situation is reverted towards the end. And this is something he, he illustrated uh, with this plot in which he was basically uh, performing spatial correlations between the errors uh, as a function of the forecast day. So he was correlating this pattern with this and this pattern with this and see how much of, of agreement there was between them. So here you can see that, for example, the correlation with the inconsistency is pretty high at the beginning. It remains more or less 
stable and, and at some moment uh, after 22, 23 days in the forecast, we see that the systematic error is starting to explain much better the, the pattern. Uh, there is still some effect. Uh, this does explain that the correlation is significant, so we can see some persistent effects of the inconsistency that would low, but would move into uh, longer forecast times, so more than a month. And, and what you can also see is that the systematic error is not fully established because the correlations are still uh, not too too high. Okay, now I'm going to show a totally different analysis, uh, again with ECR3, and this, is, this has been done by, by Juan Acosta Navarro here at the BSC, and he's been looking basically at the impact of the model resolution on, on, on the skill that we have for, over the Arctic. So the two resolutions are ORCA1, basically uh, one degree nominal resolution in the ocean and the sea ice and the atmosphere, and then ORCA 025, that would be a quarter of a degree and the same uh, components. The comparison is not perfect because when we uh, run the experiments, uh, we, we thought that it was good to use the best product available at that resolution for the initialization. So in ORCA 1, we use RS4, and in ORCA 025, to five, we use for S5. Uh, we might redo the analysis just to see uh, if there is an impact of the product that is used for initialization. But in terms of scale, these are anomaly correlation uh, coefficient uh, uh, patterns uh, for, for the CS concentration in, in, in the first winter. Uh, so yeah, I forgot to mention that these are November initialized forecasts. And what you can see is that overall, uh, the higher resolution uh, is leading to more regions in, over the Arctic uh, showing significant skill. I want to highlight is this one over, over there uh, in the north of the Barents and Kara Seas. And also maybe more importantly here, uh, close to the Canadian archipelago, uh, we see also an improvement in the skill. So in principle, we can expect improvements in the skill of the CS concentrations. These improvements do not necessarily translate into improvements in the large scale, in other large scale variables. And this is quite a, a preliminary work that I'm showing. These plots were put together by Juan yesterday. So we might uh, need to refine a little bit the analysis. But basically what he is showing is the difference in, in the anomaly correlation coefficient between the high and the low resolution in sea level pressure for winter. And we do see, for example, for the northern hemisphere, that uh, there are many regions in which the sea level pressure is more skillful, uh, and that includes uh, North America, uh, the Mediterranean region, and, and the, the North Pacific. Uh, some, some parts of the North Pacific, but we also see uh, some lower uh, scale in, in, in the Enso region, for example, and in the Indian Ocean. So yeah, it is unclear how this relates to having used different products, and that's something that we really will need to address. In terms of surface air, air temperature, then uh, the improvements in the North Atlantic are not so, so, so clear. And in particular, for example, in the Mediterranean region, which were the only improvements that we see happen in, in North Africa. Uh, just to say that these are pre preliminary results, but that we are planning to do a multimodal comparison. So um, CNRM, uh, this CNRS has, the CNRM model has also been used for this seasonal forecast and this comparison between the high and the low resolution. And we are in contact also with Environment Canada and they, they, they might also mimic some part of our experiments so that we can look together at, at the benefits of the resolution and see, for example, across systems, if the, those benefits are, are consistent, which uh, would also be a good thing uh, because any coherence uh, would 
could be point, pinned down basically to, to, to the resolution. Uh, just to conclude uh, on the results, um, I'm going to show some uh, work from University of Louvain uh, by Leandro Ponsoni on statistical predictions. Uh, these results are based on model outputs, but uh, basically as a surrogate reality. And what he's been doing with his colleagues is to, to look at seven different predictors and, and to try to use them to reconstruct this uh, September CS volume, uh, to predict the CS volume from one to 12 months uh, in advance. So using all of these predictors, what he showed is that he could highly predict uh, one month beforehand what would happen in terms of CS volume in September, also, quite decent uh, levels of skill uh, in two or three months before, and even decent models of, of skill, uh, the different uh, decent levels of skill uh, going all the way back to 12 months. So there is a lot of potential on these statistical predictions. These are actually model-based, so it, is, it would be important to see if they also ha hold uh, in, in, when, when using observations, but at least it's quite encouraging to see that using them we could ha achieve maybe higher uh, predictive levels than, than with the dynamical models. Uh, Leandro has also been working on different applications uh, of this methodology and basically to identify optimal sampling locations and therefore to guide future observing efforts. So, he did it again uh, on the same uh, six uh, different models, and I'm showing here example for three of them. And in this case, uh, he used four different predictors, all of, on variables that have been more or less well observed. And basically what he did is to, to look for the location uh, uh, in which these predictors uh, would, could predict as much as possible the CS volume and to, to identify basically he looked at the root mean square error of the predictions and once he would identify the location leading to the minimum root mean square error then you can see that these locations would vary across models okay then he would go for the second location again minimizing the root mean square error and he was iterating this uh, up to 10 times. And these are the results uh, when comparing uh, the added value of the, of the new uh, uh, locations. So, for example, here he was showing the room mean square error of the total CS volume and for all the different models. And what he could show is that for five to six locations, then we don't really see big benefits from adding uh, more. So there the, are the reason, reasonably low levels of bias in, in the total CS volume. So five to six uh, would give a decent amount, uh, um, a decent error, uh, mean square error. And in terms of total variance explained, uh, as measured by the square uh, correlation coefficient, uh, again, he was showing that for most of the models, uh, he explained up to 80% of the variance or close to 90% of the variance of the total variance in the CS volume in, in, in September. So, yeah, uh, this work uh, has been done in perfect model framework and they are trying to see if it's possible to export it to observations, which are much more limiting, actually, but at least uh, it's really helping uh, to guide uh, new observations uh, in the future. And, and to see that with only a few observing sites, observing locations, uh, we, we can have really good estimates of, of the total CS volume. This concludes uh, the scientific results and basically concludes my presentation.
I'll just go quickly uh, summarizing the, the, the key messages that I tried to convey. So about Applicate, uh, in a nutshell, just to say and to reiterate that the main purpose is to advance the predictive capacity in the polar region and uh, that we do this uh, by developing models and enhancing the representation of different Arctic processes and also by trying to contribute to the improvement of Arctic observing systems with work like the one I showed before, just before by Leandro, but also in, in, in other work packages. Then uh, that we, we want to enhance the understanding of the linkages between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes, including uh, from a prediction perspective. And that uh, uh, one of the big strengths is that we're bringing together many different communities uh, working together in, in the same direction. And then regarding highlights of World Package 5 on prediction, uh, just to say that the, the key part of World Package 5 is the framework, the experimental framework, uh, in which we are trying to establish the added value of Applicate and to provide guidance for future efforts in uh, prediction, prediction efforts. And related to, to the results I showed before, that the, the, the baseline experiments so far show good predictive skill for the sea ice extent uh, in the summer, uh, so up to three to four months, uh, which is promising. That there is some also promise, there are also promising results in terms of the resolution, uh, uh, but we'll need to see if they are consistent uh, across the, the different models. And, and finally, yeah, that the, there are many things that we can learn from statistical models, which can also be highly skillful. And that in the future, what we'll try to do is to real comparisons between the dynamical and the statistical forecast to see how, how they can benefit from each other. And that's concluding everything. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions now uh, from, from the chat. And also, if you happen to have any other question, please feel free to contact me at my email and um, I'll be happy to answer them offline. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I'll wait for your questions. Thank you, Pablo. That was a really great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions and just a reminder to everybody, uh, please type your questions into the chat panel so that I can read them aloud. And then uh, Pablo, can also see them in the chat panel and he'll be able to answer them. Uh, we have a first question from Uma Bhatt and she says, great talk, Pablo. Do you have any thoughts on which improvements may be key for improving the model representation of the Arctic? So um, among the different things that we've been considering is for example, changing the numbers of CS categories, uh, including activating melt ponds, uh, including CS rheologies, different CS rheology schemes, and none of them is really promising. Uh, most of the improvements that we see come from assimilation, for example, of uh, CS thickness. That is something that has not, had not been done before. And at least for numerical weather prediction is really, really promising. Uh, we, we have some experiments in which we are going to test it also uh, in seasonal prediction and we hope that they will be equally um, encouraging. Uh, but so far I cannot say more in that direction because we, we don't have yet the capability of assimilating them. Thank you. Um, the next question is from David Bailey, and he says, in the work by Leandro and others, did you evaluate different time periods of perfect model predictability in volume? That is, was it different in the 80s and 90s, and how might it change in the future? So let me go back. Uh, I had to say, I'm not, I haven't been, I have been following their work, uh, but not too much in detail. So, um, 
Yeah, I th I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. I'm pretty sure that they have tested different yeah, um, methodological aspects because they are really thought of usually in, in their work. But I cannot really answer the impact. Just to say this is perfect model, so maybe uh, looking at specific uh, decades like the 80s or the 90s uh, in this perfect model framework, uh, I'm trying to relate it to changes in the observational period m might not be extrapolable, uh, basically because we can expect the, the models to to reproduce it. These are, yeah, I didn't say, but these are historical uh, experiments, so with no initialization. Okay, thank you. And Ed Blanchard Wigglesworth asks, are the data sets public access to non-applicant members, and how can one download if so, how can one download the data? So I know we have a portal uh, to access some of this data. Not, of the, not all the data has been uploaded to the portal because we are still trying to solve some issues. Um, I'm, yeah. I don't remember the policies. I, I would be surprised that the data is um, is close to 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 non applicate partners, so so to non applicate institutes. So probably, it, it it could be shared. And if I mean, anyone interested, uh, please feel free to contact me, and then then I'll contact the 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 relevant people. Uh, Thank yeah, you. I, I would say we've been running a lot of experiments, and it would be good to to produce as much as possible from them. So as many outcomes as possible. And the manpower in Applicate is limited. Uh, so extra hands are always welcome. Great, thanks. Um, and Umabat also asks, um, I am really intrigued about the ocean resolution experiments. Will you evaluate the Atlantic water of the Arctic? Again. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I I think not. And um, basically, it's because uh, in the project this was mostly about finding out uh, the impact of the Arctic sea ice on 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 the mid latitude. So we can expect big changes coming from the circulations and and, and the currents. Um, I would. I mean, I think it would be good to capitalize on those experiments at some point, but I don't think it will happen in the context of Applicate because we, we have like a really targeted uh, uh, targeted um, question that is the Arctic and the linkages. And yeah, I'm afraid that uh, right now we are not contemplating it. Thank you. Um, next question is from Helen Wiggins. She, asks, she says, thank you, Pablo. It seems that Applicate overall has a large component of user slash stakeholder engagement. Was there user engagement um, guided, was it, was it user engagement that guided the work done under the WP5? Not really, uh, because uh, yeah, the, as I explained, the strategy was quite Clear. We needed to be consistent from the beginning uh, to the end, so that we could compare experiments uh, that followed the same protocol and then have robust conclusions. We, we do talk a lot with them in terms of what the stakeholders need. So uh, we have then some specific analysis looking at, uh, for, for example, some extreme events. Uh, uh, and if they were related to, to the sea ice or not. Uh, there is one example that is, for example, the low sea ice uh, extent in, in, in 2016. And there's been a whole report uh, by the, by the work, done by the World Package 7 related to it um, and how it impacted different for example, sectors like energy production, uh, including also the, the climatic side. 
And there is a new one now, for example, related to, to the low sea ice, the, the, the extreme sea ice minimum in, 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 in the winter and early spring of the last year, uh, specifically in, in, in the Dutchy Sea and, and the Bering Sea. And the Bering sea. Um, and they have also, for example, identified impacts in energy production, both solar and wind power. And we are trying to see uh, from our work package if that can be linked uh, and traced back to, to, to the CIs. And so far, it seems like there is a linkage. So we, we are trying yeah, to to talk as much as possible so that the outcomes that we produce, because we have some flexibility in terms of what we're looking at in the different experiments, uh, is really relevant for them. Thank you. Um, Helga Tangen asks, uh, provides a comment. Thanks for the good presentation. As I work with the Arctic Regional Climate Center under WMO, this is Promising for our seasonal sea ice outlooks distributed twice a year. I look forward for the results. Um, and Uma also makes a comment saying Pablo collaboration on the Atlantic waters may be worth talking about more. Mm -hmm. And um, David Otnes writes to everybody um, or asks, are methane releases being factored in and or incorporated into this work? Okay. Uh, I I can start with the last one because it's easy. Uh, um, in in this in in this project, there is no uh, no, no chemistry, so we are not considering any chemistry. We are just using um, ocean atmosphere couple GCMs, and that's yeah, basically the focus. But there is a new call, and we we might submit a follow up of applicate, and that call is going to include. Uh, it, I mean, the, the the European call is specifically saying that uh, atmospheric and ocean chemistry needs to be included. So we are looking at ways of, uh, yeah, designing experiments that could help answer their their different effects and. Methane and uh, different aerosols, for example, will be probably considered. That's related to that one. For the Atlantic water, um, I, I would say that it's worth, worth talking. Uh, yeah. if, even if we cannot look at it, uh, we, we would be happy sharing some data. Uh, or even if some some other people have similar experiments, and then we can look together at different aspects. It's always good to to have new ideas. And re regarding the first, uh, so we in 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 applicate and there is a deliverable uh, for the next year that is to contribute basically to this uh, CS outlooks. So yeah, <laughs> we really hope that uh, with all, all, all the different models uh, contributing, we'll be able to, to learn much more about what we can do, especially in, in a multimodal framework, which seems to be, uh, to have a, a big potential. So yeah, hopefully with the enhanced models, things will look better. Um, but even with the baseline ones, uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can be satisfied that there is some skill and that we can uh, hope to, to provide useful information. Thank you. Um, and I've invited people, there's, there's a little bit more time. Um, are there any further questions from, every, from anyone? I don't see any. Um, Pablo, did you have any uh, concluding remarks? Well, maybe what I can say is that so today I only showed like work in progress and I presented the project like in, 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 uh, like, uh, in broad terms. 
what I hope is that towards the end of the project, we'll have more impactful results and uh, either me or some other colleague uh, will be happy to, to come back and give an, another webinar. Especially, uh, we, we could appreciate feedback about what you would be more interested on and, and then we can see yeah, which specific work can be done. But so far, yeah, I, I would wait to see that we, yeah, we have time to, to complete the analysis and, and maybe talk to you in a year time and, and see what we can offer in that sense. Thank you. Well, uh, people are saying thank you for the good presentation and seeing no further questions from the group, um, I will um, we'll go back to uh, the overall questions and say um, thank you. On behalf of Arcus and the SIPIN uh, leadership team, I want to thank Pablo for sharing his presentation and also to Muyan Wong for organizing today's event. Um, today's webinar will be, oops, I'm not, I'm not, there we go. This will be archived at arcus.org, SIPIN meeting webinars, and we will notify the community when that uh, archive is available. We do welcome your feedback and ask you to help us improve the webinar series by taking our very short seminar evaluation survey, which is at this address, which is www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash 72. And this link um, is, should be available in the chat window. Uh, it will be also included in the follow-up email you'll receive once the seminar video recording has been posted online. And with that, we want to thank everybody, um, and this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for participating today. Thank you, Pablo, for a great presentation. Hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks also to you and to everyone in the organization and to all the attendees. It's been a it really was nice. Great. This was a great event. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye. Bye.